it's bad business. Even exactly. if you want to argue, you know, this or that about the, the the more controversial side of things. I'll probably edit that out. That wasn't very eloquent either. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Bill, Bill and today we're going to talk some science. It's a series where I got to come up with a cool catchphrase for it. It's a series where I want to talk to people who don't necessarily work in science about science and how it shapes their day to day lives and what they do. And today we have an absolute treat for me because it's a, a way blast from the past. We are talking to Mike Salvage, who is here as an all around bat, as a musician, as a, a music tech, and then as a carnivorous plant expert. So, Mike, welcome. Hey, glad to see you again, man. Uh, you are in Lincoln, Nebraska, where I lived for five years, and uh, we hung out and we played music together and caused trouble in general. And we had a really cool band that we'll talk about in a little while. Um, so yeah, let's talk some science. Um, how, well, before we get to specific scientific questions, one thing I've been asking everybody is, uh, obviously we're still in a pandemic. We're starting to kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel, but it has been now, it just passed a year since New York City closed. How do you stay inspired to continue doing the right thing? I know there have been days here where I, have just felt like, why do we even try anymore? But I at least have the advantage of being surrounded by people all day who are um, much more in the same boat. I actually put, uh, you kind of gave me a heads up that that question might be coming. And, and I actually tried to put a fair amount of thought into an answer. And I, and I spent probably five or 10 minutes sitting there going like, oh, I don't even know how to approach this. And then it's like, okay, yeah, I do. Just in terms of trying to stay inspired while, you know, just there's so much conflict and turmoil in the world and so many things that, that could kind of bring you down. Um, and uh, I don't think this is something that we've ever talked about, but um, I've uh, been diagnosed with um, uh, depressive disorder. And uh, so that's honestly kind of something that even before COVID I kind of struggled with is, is just like trying to keep that energy up, trying to keep going and, you know, not succumbing to the darkness, if you will. Um, I would say that just kind of in a very, very general sense, the most important thing that somebody and myself included, um, just find something that stimulates you or interests you. Um, and it, it doesn't matter if it's, oh, wow, this is really cool. Or it's like, oh, that's interesting. Just something that makes you ask why or how. Um, I mean, there are no wrong answers. Like just pick, just find a hobby, even if it's something you don't care about or you don't want to do. Like learn how to knit. If you don't like it, you don't have to keep knitting. Now, you know, one thing that doesn't do it for you, just move on to the next thing. So uh, as you know, I'm a, I'm a drummer and uh, that, that, that was about it. I uh, couldn't really do anything else, but uh, I decided I was gonna learn how to play the bass. So that's kind of been all consuming um, for my time. <laughs> One of my favorite bands is Primus. And uh, I just kind of set a goal for myself that seemed completely unattainable. Uh, I wanted to learn how to play Tommy the Cat. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, but uh, it's, a, it's a bit tricky, uh, quite fast. And uh, yeah, I, I was finally able to do that. And honestly, I would say it's probably my crowning achievements of the last year <laughs> um, is uh, learning how to play most of Tommy the Cat right. <laughs> I found that taking care of plants definitely uh, helped kind of fill that void, partly because it's a whole new way of learning about living things. Why don't you just take it away. I don't have a lot of specific questions. You can just kind of, you want to give us a quick tour. If you want to show us anything awesome, just kind of take it I'll try, to, I'll try to do a quick little tour of some of my favorites. I'm not a botanist. I just really like this stuff. So uh, my absolute favorite plant, like if I had to call one, like my little baby, um, it would definitely be this one. And hopefully it's going to come across in the picture. 
This is a known as a Nepenthes, um, otherwise known as a tropical pitcher plant. There are two varieties, uh, a highland and a lowland, and then there's kind of a an in-between or a, a hybrid. They're more hardy, easier to raise. Uh, this is definitely one of the hybrids, and it's really cool. I'm not sure if it's going to show up on my camera, but on the outside, you can see uh, almost like little crystals, or it looks like water's pooling on it, maybe. And that is like a nectar that the plants use to draw in bugs. And then, you know, bugs fall in and then they get digested and then just kind of think of it as basically like an open stomach. It's kind of gross, but also kind of really cool. Uh, this guy right here is um, kind of the common name for it would be a uh, like a trumpet pitcher plant or, or the, I think this is a, a Saracenia flava. Um, and its name, the yellow pitcher plants, maybe. Um, but yeah, it's it's crazy because this this uh, second one right here, you know, it's it's about to open up, which is really cool. But just to kind of underscore how fast and rewarding these things actually are, this was just like a thin blade of leaf until maybe two days ago. Like the la last time I looked at this was yesterday or maybe the day before. Um, and the uh, hood was not separated at all. And you can see that it's finally starting to open up. Um, that was completely closed yesterday. So I mentioned sundews. And this guy right here is what's known as a cape sundew or uh, Drosera capensis. Um, so they grow these little blade shaped leaves. And then they have these look like little fuzzies that come off of them. But so they grow these little purple hairs. And then when they're mature, um, they grow these little shiny globs on the end of each one of those little hairs. Um, and it looks like dew. And that's why they're called sundews. A little bug will fly along and land on that. And then they get stuck. And um, then when they're stuck in there, the plants, those little hairs will slowly bend in to get as many of them touching the plant as possible. And you can even kind of see it starting with this little guy right here, uh, a little gnat landed there at some point, and the actual leaf will curl up around it. And it's not lightning fast, but we're talking over the span of maybe 20 minutes and it just slowly wraps around to get as many of those little hairs touching the prey and as much digestive fluid and all that and then they just kind of vampire it out. This is the very first fly trap that I have ever owned. Um, it is a giant variety meaning the traps um, will get up to two-ish inches wide. The first thing that pops out here is the colors right we were just talking about that like they're just yeah plants in and of their own right you know whether you get the flower on them or not plant themselves is just amazing. And basically we're looking at like a combo mouth stomach, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, the trap is the actual leaf. And this uh, little area right here is what's known as the petiole. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, and that's, it's, it's basically the stem, a modified stem um, that gives it more surface area for, uh, you know, photosynthesis and stuff like that. Cool. So I caught a pinhead and he escapes. Your camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, the cricket tried to run under my laptop. Oh. Cool. Yeah. So have a little cricket boy. So I'm gonna take that. Get a get a decent view on this trap right here. Yep. Cool. So I'm just gonna take him and set him right there in the middle and brush one of those hairs a couple times. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, make sure you don't pull the cricket out with those. Right. So that's closed now, kind of in the initial state. And you can see that the trap is kind of, that the trap is very uh, concave. Mm -hmm. um, whereas this is the one that I fed that worm the other day. And you can see that it's a lot thinner. Oh wow! And yeah. over the course, over the course of this, this, over the course of this cricket trying to escape, 
um, basically it's going to keep stimulating and sending that close signal to the leaf and it's just slowly going to do that. Um, I don't fully understand the mechanics of what's going on, but it has something to do with um, a voltage difference that is created within the leaf when one of those hairs is triggered from one side of the leaf to the other, there's um, some cells are holding more water than others. And the voltage difference that is created in the leaf when the little trigger hairs get tripped, um, basically cause it to equalize or reverse the uh, pressure, you know, which cells have water more water and uh that's actually what facilitates the movement is it's kind of like a hydraulic thing wow. um i probably did not explain that very accurately but on a very fundamental intro level um we'll go with that awesome. well of course there's one other thing we got to do which is we got to do some science now this one I have been doing nonstop for about a year now. It's my number one go-to, um, but I usually do it in a little sandwich bag. And I figured, well, since you're a percussionist, you're no stranger to loud bang. So I thought, let's let's up it a little bit. I'm going to try it with a gallon bag. Uh, uh, I too have a gallon bag. Awesome. So we are going to create a chemical reaction inside this bag between baking soda vinegar, right? The classic volcano ingredients. You mix them together, baking soda. Um, is uh, sodium bicarbonate, it's a base, and vinegar is acetic acid. And when you mix them together, chemical reaction creates carbon dioxide gas. We're gonna use some toilet paper to kind of mediate that because what we wanna do is we're gonna trap it in, we're gonna trap that reaction inside the bag. And if we do it just right, the bag, once it gets to a critical capacity of gas will explode. So we've got our uh, gallon Ziploc bag. We've got our tank that we're gonna put this into because once it goes off, we wanna make sure to catch the mess. Plus if we give it a resonant body, we're gonna get a little more bang for our, uh, for our reaction. And we're gonna need, I'm gonna say a cup and a half of vinegar. Now, like I said, if you are at home and you're using a sandwich size bag, you're not gonna need as much scale that down to about a half a cup. But if you're using the full gallon, you need about a cup and a half, and then you're going to need six spoonfuls of baking soda. And I'm going to grab some toilet paper. If you've got Kleenex or um, just something that's kind of a porous paper, toilet paper just makes a really good uh, crop. I'm going to just make a uh, an X or a, a cross hatch here with some toilet paper. We're going to put the baking soda right in the middle of it, and then we're going to wrap it up into the toilet paper or the tissue. Okay. And then, yeah, we're gonna do about six scoops of baking soda. So it's a pretty healthy dose. Once you've got it in the middle of your crosshatch here, your toilet paper, you're just gonna fold it all up into a nice little, uh, a nice little baking soda present. A little bindle. So we're just gonna set this aside for a moment. And we're gonna go on over to our vinegar. This is where we can get our container ready if you want. Um, I am going to put in a cup and a half of vinegar. What we're going to do is we're going to just pick up the whole baking soda parcel. We're going to gently just kind of drop it or plop it into the vinegar. We're going to zip up the bag. Here's the safety warning. Do not put your face directly over the top of the bag. But well, we should do a countdown. I don't know if we can do a live countdown. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Drop it in and then just zip it up. You can already hear it. You can already see it. The bag is expanding. It's getting bigger. I'm not gonna put my face over it. You can give it a little shake if you need to, to get it to kind of do its final thing. Oh my goodness. Mmm, <laughs> I don't know. Oh. Nice. <laughs> I was kind of hoping, I was kind of hoping that it would blow the, it's like a hinged lid on this. I was kind of hoping that it would do that. It is so cool. One other way that we know each other is we were in a band together called Stowe. Uh, mostly instrumental, a little bit of vocals. And so on the play out here, uh, the people are already probably starting to hear a track. Uh, we'll pick one here after the interview. 
and go check that out. The band camp is still up. The bass player, Kyle, put all the tracks online. They're still there. You can still listen to them all. So I'll put the link here somewhere. One more time, this has been uh, Mike Salvage, drummer, uh, music tech, apparently electronics enthusiast. I didn't even know. Carnivorous plant expert and just all around. It was super cool to talk to you after so long. Uh, absolutely fascinating stuff. I look forward to maybe following up with you again in a couple of months. And until then, everybody out there, do more science. Have more fun. Awesome. Thank you very much, Mike. Have a great day. We'll see you again, okay? Yeah, man. What up? Propylene. Ammonium. Tetrasodium. Cocomada extract. Methyl hydrochromium benzenate. So far.